This week's lecture is going to be just a little bit different than last time. Rather than going through some PowerPoint slides, I figured the book does a pretty good job of covering the technical aspects, and rather than have me repeat those, I'm going to let you do the reading there um, and not bore you with the PowerPoint. Instead, I figured I'd show you a tip or two in Photoshop and go over some of the techniques that the book may not cover in depth or might help to just walk through and see those visually. So let's take a look, and I've got some files queued up here to, to demonstrate on. We'll just go through a couple of things. So first off, before I do anything else, what I want to do is to assign my color settings and to save my color settings. I can synchronize, synchronize those across my Adobe devices or, or programs. So if we go to Edit and choose Color Settings down here in the Edit menu, Note that I do this without a document open. I don't want this to apply to a specific open document, and I want it to apply to Photoshop in general for everything I do. So I want to do this while I don't have any open documents. So color settings. I get this dialog here. First option is a drop down window where I can choose some defaults, some presets, I suppose you could call them, based on the type of work that you're going to be doing most commonly in Photoshop. Now, most of the time, that would be uh, pre-pressed 2 is going to be something, or general purpose 2 might be something that you use. Uh, we're not in Europe or Japan, so those don't apply to us. Um, those have to do with different um, standards for the color profiles and color spaces that are used. We're going to use uh, general purpose 2 to start with, but I'm going to modify mine. So, the working spaces are, are RGB, CMYK, gray, and spot. Those correspond to the different type of color modes or models that we're going to be working on, or document types that we're going to be working on in the different color models. If we put our cursor over each of these, you can see there's a little description that pops up down below. So, sRGB, for example, for my RGB working space, it says, if we were to scroll through that and look, it says, ideal space for web work, but not recommended for pre-press work. So if you do strictly web work, you're doing design and content creation for the web, then sRGB would be fine for you. If we want to look through some of these other options, there's quite a few more. Profoto, for example. If we choose Profoto and hover over that, it says, this is a color space particularly suited for output devices such as digital dye sub, inkjet photo printers, applications such as Hi-Fi Color. It encompasses the entire range of photographic materials. If you're a photographer and you see one that says Pro Photo, <laughs> it makes you feel good, right? So Pro Photo is, is typically for that sort of thing. If you work with raw photos, if you capture your own images, then Pro Photo might be a good working space for you. I realize that we haven't talked about working space yet. It's covered in detail in the reading. So if you're watching this lecture before the reading, I recommend that you go do the reading first and then come back here. All right, so because I particularly focus on photography mainly when I'm using Photoshop and not when I'm just teaching classes, I'll use Profoto. For my CMYK working space, in this case, I would choose something that's closest to the output of the device that I'm going to be using, the press or whatever I'm going to be printing on. So I'm going to choose, in this case, Grackle 2006 because that happens to match up closely to the Indigo in the print imaging lab on campus, which if we ever go there again, I will print there, <laughs> probably. So I'm going to use Grackle. Um, it's not a web offset press, so swap is not appropriate. It's not necessarily the best. The sheet-fed offset digital press that is, is in the print lab can hit Grackle, so I'm going to use that for now. And then down below, I'm going to ignore gray and spot because I don't really do anything with those. I'm just going to leave them at their defaults. You guys can, can do these however you want to. I'm just showing you my process of setting up Photoshop. So here, color management policies. This is how you want Photoshop to handle uh, when you bring an image into Photoshop. So if we bring in RGB or C1K or gray, what do you want to do? Do you want it to convert it to whatever the working RGB profile is or working CMYK? Do we want it to not do anything? Do we want it to preserve? And the assumption is that if a file has a profile embedded in it, then someone put it there for a reason. And we don't want to go converting anything until we get to the end. So I'm going to leave preserve embedded profiles. And the reason that we don't want to convert to the end, we'll talk about in a minute. So 
The next few boxes here, these can get obnoxious if you teach classes and you're demonstrating something and just kind of willy-nilly copying and pasting images into Photoshop. You're trying to just show how to use Photoshop, then uh, turn these off. But for most standard usage, we want to turn these on so that Photoshop can prompt us anytime there's an image that is missing a profile or it has a profile that's something other than our current working space or when we copy and paste, we want to turn those on and we'll see what those look like. And again, there's little tooltip descriptions that show up below. Uh, leave this on Adobe. We don't need to go with Microsoft or Apple if you're on an operating system that's different. The rendering intent, you guys learned about rendering intents already. We're going to leave it on the default relative colorimetric. Um, in these two colorimetrics, uh, relative and absolute, we know that there's a difference in how the white point is shifted uh, or adjusted to compensate for the white point of the paper or media that's being converted to between the source and the destination conversion. So that's what's taking place here. Now, black point compensation is kind of the same thing, but for the black point instead of the white point. Typically, this will give you a little bit better results when you're converting. Um, Dither, if you're working with photographs, then use Dither. If you're printing test charts or calibration sheets, then we want to turn Dither off. So this is going to kind of blend some of those colors to give us a little bit better appearance, less blocky. But if you're going for 100% accuracy, like you would with the test chart, then you want to turn that off. Uh, compensate for scene referred profiles. That's a video thing I don't use After Effects. Um, so it doesn't matter to me, but I'm just going to leave it on. This one right here, desaturate monitor colors by 20% uh, or whatever percent. Notice the very last line in that description below says this setting is recommended for expert users only. <laughs> so I like to think of myself as an expert, but I don't do anything that critical enough that it would need to be adjusted. So I'm going to leave this off for now too. But basically, we know that some color spaces, the gamut is extremely large larger than what most monitors can display. So in order to have a real, more realistic look of what those perceptual colors are, then we might just desaturate the colors of that file so that it looks more natural on our screen. And that can be good, but the reason that experts are required to use this is that the colors are going to be completely different in the print. All the colors are changed on your screen so that what you see on the screen is not going to look like what you print. So I like to leave that off. Um, blend colors, we'll leave that off too. And blend text colors, leave it on. These you can just leave at the default. Now you notice that this little chip here says it's unsynchronized. We've got Photoshop out of sync with the rest of my Creative Cloud applications. So if we were to want to synchronize these settings, we could do it a number of different ways. One is we could have done this first using Adobe Bridge. And if we change these color settings in Bridge, then it's going to save a color settings file and we can sync, we can open that up in bridge and uh, copy it across all our other apps. So we could save this color settings here and it's going to create a, a color settings file. We can share that. If you're in a workspace where everybody's sharing files and documents and collaborating, then it might be a good idea to all be on the same page here, whether that's using one of these settings, these presets or creating your own setting that's specific to your company or your offices or your freelance groups, uh, workflow processes, then uh, it'd be good to have everybody on the same page here and be synchronized across the board. All right, so that said, let's open up a file and start looking at Photoshop here. So if I click down on this little guy, I've got a file in my previous images. And when I try to open that, I get that missing profile dialog. And you may or may not have seen this before in Photoshop. Um, a lot of times you'll get tired of it and just go into the menu and turn it off. But leave it on because it's important. It's going to ask what do we want to do when we open up this file. And again, part of the important stuff, if you've done the reading, is every image needs to have a profile. So this helps us to make sure we do that. That said, I'm going to ignore it for right now so that we can play with some other stuff later. But normally we want to assign it to our working profile or to a profile of our choice, depending on what it is that we want to do. We can assign it later. So I'm just going to say leave as is, hit OK, and open this document. Now this is kind of just a stunt file, I guess you could call it. It's not really an image. It's just a, a generated, numerically generated um, grid of every 
one of the 16.7-ish million colors that you can come up with using a combination of red, green, and blue, and 256 levels of each. So how you make red, green, and blue into all these different colors, that's the topic for another class that hopefully you guys have taken in the past. If that's something that you guys want to dig into a little bit, I can provide some resources, just let me know. All right, so not a very interesting image uh, visually, but we're going to look at it and play a bit. So first off, we've already done our color settings, which gave us that, that pop-up dialog. And I noticed that the one that I opened up is actually not the original file, because I can see that it already has a profile. So if we look down at the bottom of Photoshop, bottom left corner, you'll see this Adobe RGB 1998, or whatever profile your, your document has. This image that I opened up is not, it's got a, a profile in it. So I'm going to close it. <laughs> and go find the actual, unless I overwrote it, saved it wrong. Okay, I think we're here. Okay, I, I checked this box. I was talking and not paying attention. So leave it as is, don't color manage. Okay, so again, that's not typically the way that you would do this, but to demonstrate it, that's what I'm doing. So I wanted to show you that if we have an image in Photoshop, and it says untagged down here, that means this image doesn't have an ICC profile embedded. So it doesn't contain that little bit of metadata that tells Photoshop and your RIP or a browser or any other program that sees that file, it doesn't tell that file what the color values mean. All right, so let's fix that. We go to edit and all of our color conversion options and color settings are gonna be down here under the edit menu for now anyhow. So color settings, we already took care of that. We want to assign profile or convert to profile. The difference between these two is assign profile is for setting the source space. And if it doesn't have a source space, this is where we would give it one or convert to profile. So similar, similar process, but convert to profile is more for when we already have a source space and we want to change it to a destination space. So input profile, output profile, another way to look at that. So let's just see what they do. Assign profile. All right, so we can say don't color manage the document, but our whole thing here is color management. So we, we're gonna skip that and just go to working RGB, which in my case is pro photo, but we can also choose a different setting. And because I have preview checked here, you can see the changes taking place. And I can pick, let's find um, something else in here. We're still, these are only RGB options that are being listed right now in this list. There's sRGB. And you can see there's a pretty significant difference between sRGB and Profoto. It has to do with the size or the gamut of that color space. So let's leave it on Profoto. RGB right now because we want to keep all the colors intact that were there to begin with. Or let's just hit cancel. So if I were to work on this, I would want to assign them, but I want to play with a little bit more. So I'm going to leave it untagged for right now. All right. So I'm going to skip converting to profile right now because we're going to go somewhere else real quick. So another place that you can do some color settings. And remember I said before that down here, this is where you'll change all the color settings in a file, it's true. But there's one other place where you'll view those color settings. And if, you, if you've done the reading again, there's a section that talks about actually making the changes to color and just simulating those changes. So um, I've been on a kick of baking lately. Many of you might've been doing that with us staying at home and such. So if you scoop a scoop of flour out of a bucket or a bag, Sometimes it's kind of heaped up and this may, I, I should have provided a visual to kind of illustrate this, but if we want to actually measure one cup of flour or something else, then we need to scrape off the top of that so that it's flat and level, right? And the result is that a chunk of that flour, a portion of that gets swept away, right? It goes back into the bag or, or on the counter or wherever we're working. So think of our color kind of like that. This original image without a color profile, without any color management being applied, is just all the color that's in the file. It's all there. It's all intact. If we were to assign this or convert it to a smaller, to any gamut, 
profile, any, any working space, any output space, whatever. If we're going to convert this and assign it to a color profile or assign a color profile to it, what we're doing essentially is saying, here's a container, it's this big, and we're going to pack all the color in there and we're going to sweep off whatever doesn't fit. Now, how the color gets smushed into that cup and how it gets swept off depends on the rendering intent. And I think I'm losing my analogy here, my comparison, but uh, maybe that makes sense. We have a bunch of color existing in this image right now, and we want to make it fit into a smaller gamut, then the excess color has to go somewhere. It gets compressed, right? So we're going to lose color. So the idea is that we don't ever want to convert color or change color in our document until we are completely done. We want to postpone that and change it the fewest number of times and at the very last point where that needs to take place. Now, our workflow may dictate that we see what's going on with our file in terms of color on an output device or something else. What I would recommend is rather than converting to CMYK at the start of your workflow, keep it in RGB and just simulate CMYK. So if we go to view and proof setup, you can choose to visualize what that working or output is going to look like on your screen without ever making the change. So I'm going to choose custom just so we can see all the options and we can choose the proof condition that we want to see. So this is dependent on there being a source space. So at this point, I'm going to go back and I'm going to actually assign a profile. So let's go assign profile and let's make it RGB, you don't see any difference in the preview because Profoto RGB is ginormous color space. The gamut is huge and it encompasses all of the colors that were part of this document already. So we'll just hit OK. Now let's go view, proof setup, and custom one more time. And we can say if we were to take this file and print that using the Grackle standard or reference, uh, or swap or newsprint or whatever other kind of profile we want to simulate, we can do that. We can say what's it going to look like with perceptual rendering intent or saturation or whatever. We can preview the effects. We can choose to use black point compensation or not. And, and you'll see with this on and off, a lot of times it probably won't make a whole ton of difference. We can simulate the paper color. So in this case, Grackle, this is grade one coded paper will use simulate paper color and it's in turn going to simulate black ink so it's checked and left on we can toggle that preview on and off and see yeah there's a big difference but then we can go ahead through our workflow of editing in an rgb workflow but we see the results in cmyk so let me open up the info panel and just demonstrate this a little bit so the info panel is going to give us a readout wherever the cursor is of those color values and, and just so we can be precise here, I'm going to press uh, I to get my eyedropper tool right there. Then if I shift click somewhere, and I'm just going to kind of at random pick here on this green, it's going to place a little target there, and that target corresponds to over here. So RGB values are 73, 179, and 103, or we can preview that as CMYK color, and it's giving us a little warning here, but we'll leave it alone for now. The warning just means that this is the soft proofed color, not the actual color of the underlying file. We can see what it is in LAB or whatever. We can choose to preview that without actually making a change. We can see what that color value is. This could be useful if you're working with, for example, a brand color or something where you have the process color readout or the RGB values for that and you're converting it to something else, you want to see how it's going to work out and how close it is. It can be helpful to look at the lab colors there um, and see nothing's changing, whatever. But, all right, let's go on. So I just wanted to show you that we can preview this and rather than making some kind of destructive change to our file by throwing away a whole bunch of color information, then uh, work in RGB. Keep it in RGB, keep it in a large working space, uh, and then convert it at the very end, when you're ready to print, when you're ready to proof it, when you're ready to uh, send it to press or send it to your desktop printer. At that point, you'll convert it. 
And even then, that conversion process, if you've proofed it on your screen, and, and disclaimer, this should be obvious to most of you at this point, hopefully, is that your screen needs to be calibrated for this to be useful to you. If your screen's not calibrated, then you can't trust what it's showing either way. But screen's calibrated, we're gonna output this, and we can output it a number of different ways. For example, we can export as a JPEG or a PNG, or we can save for web. And both of those are gonna have options to embed sRGB as a profile, because it's going to the web. If we're gonna print, we're gonna go file, print, and the print dialog is going to give us some options here. Say the printer manages the color, or Photoshop manages the color. Let's say Photoshop does. And we can choose the printer profile that we wanna use. And I don't know, I haven't messed with this in a minute. Uh, but we have a document profile, that's our source. And a printer profile, that's our output. So this is that convert uh, profile right here taking place. And we can choose the rendering intent, whether there's black point composition. We can choose hard proofing, which is where we're gonna do a press proof. Um, but that's in the reading, I'll let you guys focus on that there. I wanna get onto some other stuff here. All right, we have, let's get out of that. Back here in the view menu, we've got another option. And I can just turn off those proof colors here. So we see our original, it's all untouched, nothing's happened to it. If I turn on gamut warning though, it looks at all the values in this and says, anywhere that's got that gray overlay or tint or stain, that's those are colors that are gonna be changed when we convert this. So because I've got my uh, output going to, what did I have, Grackle, 2006? When I go from this large gamut image to print, and it's gonna to convert to the color values that are in CMYK, those pixel values are gonna change and this is gonna be, it's not gonna look like this, it's not gonna be gray, but anything that has a gray, those are things that are gonna be changing. Anything that's still showing, those are colors that are gonna stay the same. So you can see there's a portion of those, every one of those little gradient squares that is gonna remain the same. So with this displayed, we can make some edits to our image to try and minimize the changes that are taking place, or we can use this to determine what is the appropriate rendering intent, what's gonna give us the best results. So those are just a few things I wanted to show you guys. To finish this up, I'm just gonna show you one other thing here to kind of, I don't know, hopefully give you some ideas of things that you can do with Photoshop. And I forgot, I just realized to prepare an image to display this, so I'm just gonna pull one up that I have on my screen, my recent files, let's play with this one. So this is just a, a file that I pulled off the internet earlier today for a different class entirely. So we're gonna play with it and it's embedded with Adobe RGB and I put it there so I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna say, okay, use the embedded profile instead of the working space. All right, now our scenario here, we're gonna just pretend for a minute is that I'm gonna print this on a commercial offset press. So this is gonna be uh, printed in CMYK. And so what I wanna do before anything else, before I start editing this, is I'll just change my proof setup and we'll go custom. And let's look at this as Grackle. And if I toggle that on and off, you see there's some difference. It's not quite as bright, it's not quite as vivid. Let's set okay. And now we're previewing this and we can look and I've got CMYK readout over here and I've got RGB readout over here and I can change these, whatever. But um, looking at my image, that's what I'm working with. And it did get a little darker, that's okay. But now whatever edits, let's say I'm gonna do some compositing, some masking, um, some color correction in terms of just visual, let's say style, uh, some contrast, whatever else I do, then I can preview this and I can uh, turn on that gamut warning and just see if there's any issues. And these little bit of gray that pops in there may be hard to see on certain images, so we can change that. I'm not getting into it, but just know you can change that from gray to a different color for that warning, so it's something that stands out a bit more. In this case, um, there's a little bit that's gonna change, and the thing is with that gamut warning, it doesn't show you how much it changes. It would be kind of cool if there was like a gradient where you could do, uh, based on the delta E of the change, 
you know, maybe green is not a big change and red is a really, really big change. And so you could kind of decide if, you know, let's just roll with it and go ahead and convert it and not worry too much about it. Which in this case, looking at what those are, it's the shadow values. There's just something in the shadows that's not going to convert, uh, that's outside of the gamut. Going from Adobe RGB down to Grackle, when we output this, there's going to be a change. But it may be, okay, so I'm going to ignore that for right now because it's not a huge issue. The areas where that was showing up weren't terribly big, but I could use that and then maybe say like desaturate it a little bit or shift the hue a tad and see if I can correct for that and still have a visually pleasing look on my image. But what I want to do is for you guys to show you a little bit in curves. So let me get rid of that. We'll just do a curves adjustment layer. Okay, and my screen is not completely displayed because the screen recording software takes up space. But I've got my curves panel here, and I'll try to make this even bigger on the image. The curves shows a histogram, and we don't need all this. Okay. So remember, we're going to CMYK. So it's going to be important for me to see my info panel now. Now, if, again, I don't have an image to demonstrate this visually to you, so you have to kind of use your imagination for a second. But if we're printing, what is white in our print? It's simply the absence of any ink, right? So wherever there's bare paper, that's white. So if we've got a continuously toned image, in other words, a photograph, and there's a white portion of that photograph, what's going to happen is there's going to be ink running up in all the colors and shadows and values throughout that image until it gets to that white spot. And then it'll be just bare paper. So I don't know if you've ever seen this, but try it out sometime maybe with a piece of uh, paper on inkjet or some other kind of printing press or look at an example of something that you get. Maybe an uncoated paper would, would maybe work the best for this. But you have solid ink and then bare paper. There's sometimes a change in texture and reflectivity. That ink on top of the paper is going to have a slightly bit of a glossy thing, depending on the density of the ink. And there's, there's factors that may make this not so much of an issue. But sometimes you may find samples that will, will look bad, where you've got essentially a hole in the print. Where white is, there's no ink. So we want to try and kind of solve for that just a tiny bit. And this is, this is something that can be taken care of um, by the profile being used and the printer, meaning the people running the press and the pre-press people. So you may not have to deal with this, but just to show you kind of a concept of what's taking place sometimes in those profiles and something that you might want to do occasionally on your own, depending on the type of the image, we're going to set our white point and our black point in this to solve for some of those problems that could happen. So let's do one thing. We're going to throw a check layer on this. A check layer is simply some kind of layer, an adjustment or otherwise, that is going to, oops, let's cancel that, that is going to allow us to visualize an effect or something that's taking place in our, in our photo. So in this case, I'm going to use a threshold adjustment layer. And threshold just gives me a slider. It's a very simple adjustment layer. It's giving me a slider that says anything brighter than this spot, make it white, anything darker, make it black. So we're going to do that. We're going to use a threshold and find the darkest points in this image, which I have to zoom in to get pretty close here and, and see where I'm at. Let's say right about there. That's pretty dark, right? And I'm going to switch back to my eyedropper tool and shift, hold down shift and click. And now I've got a target. And I probably didn't get that quite right. Let me undo. And try it about like that. Then we'll go the other way. Let's go over to this side and I'll zoom out. And most of the white parts over here, if I remember right, that's kind of where the flower was, the bright bits of flower over here. So again, let's zoom in and try to get this right. Uh, it's going to make a difference where you click with this. So you want to get it as accurate as you can. So I'm going to slide this all the way over to 255. That means that these values in the image are actually like white, white, white. There's no detail, there's no color, no nothing. So let's make this really accurate. I should have been more accurate with that black point, but let's just 
ignore that for a second and shift click there and we'll just go with it. <laughs> All right. Now I don't need that threshold adjustment anymore. So I'm going to get rid of it. And if I zoom out now, I've got two targets, one in an area that should be pure black and one that should be pure white. All right. And I'll use those to make a curves adjustment. And I can see in my RGB values here, they're 255 for red, green, blue and 100. So there's a teensy little bit of red in there, but I'm going to ignore that for now. I'm going to look at this in CMYK. And looking at that, now I can see that there would be 0% ink going down in that spot. Okay, so over here, we have 88, 76, 69, and 96. Those are the ink percentages that are going down to lay down that thick, dense black right there. So we might want to make an adjustment to this. In my curves panel, I can play a little bit. So I can, if I make an adjustment to this, and I always forget, I get this backwards every time. Right there, okay, that's my black point. So let's go back. If I take my white point over this way, it's gonna brighten up the image. But if I bring that white point down like this, it's gonna darken down the image, right? But what that's really doing is it's just adjusting that one point of white, the brightest parts there, I want to just limit it to that. So because I can't resist as a photographer putting a little bit more contrast in there, I'm going to add an S curve, which just means we put a little bit of an S shape. It darkens the shadows down and brightens the highlights up. That might be a little bit too much, but I'm over exaggerating it so that we can see this happening a little bit better on the recording of my screen. And then I'm going to drag this top one down just a tad until I see the CMYK values getting a little bit of tone in there. We want to just put a little bit of ink down at that whitest bright point. Okay, so the result here is that we're going to get some color. There's going to be some ink put down in the whites. They're not, they're going to be a great component. So think back to when we talked about gray component replacement. Um, if we have four, three, and three there, the result is that the CMY mixture, those process colors, that build, is going to look like really, 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 really light gray if we were to just look at that. It's going to be enough that there's not just a, a sudden gap where there's absolutely no ink and just blank paper either. So that should solve that issue to a certain extent. Now, this particular image is already kind of color corrected, but if we had an image that had a color cast and you hadn't already fixed that uh, in Camera Raw or Lightroom or whatever you're processing your photos in, we have a color cast that we want to fix, then we could do that here in Curves too. And all we would do is just drop down this list and go channel by channel. So I, I didn't mention that I did this, but let me back up. To, to show you this next part, I... I put this back. So let me just reset the whole thing. I'll just reset that curve completely. So now let's go into our colors. So red first. And if we were to bring down just the red channel, then notice what it does is it adds cyan. And if we bring down the green channel, for example, that adds magenta, right? So in this case, what we're doing is setting the white point in our image, but we're doing it channel by channel. So to get the, the values we want to work here, we probably want to have a little bit more cyan than magenta and yellow because it's a, it's a weaker ink. So we need to have a little bit more density of it to keep up with the others. So let's just bring this down just a hair. Let's get that to about two. And visually in the image, you won't see a whole lot of difference taking place, but let's play with these. I forgot the order that I went in here. Okay, there we go. So three, two, and two, that's gonna give us just a tiny little bit of density there. And if I toggle this on and off, you can't see much difference, okay? 
And what I might do to offset the fact that the whole thing got a little bit darker is come back into the composite there and just grab the highlights here and bring that up just a little bit. And watch those values. I might need to, it, it's kind of a little back and forth, a little finicky. Helps to drag this window out a little bigger so you've got a bigger curve to interact with there. But anyway, um, like I said, this image was already color corrected, so it didn't take a whole lot. But I could do that same thing for the black point. So the black point right now, we've got different values. We've got 88, 76, and 69. And there is kind of a color cast in that. It's like a brown little dish. So I don't want to make that pure black. But if I did, if that actually were the case, I could do the same way. Go into these individual channels and notice that we've got some adjustments. Let's make this a little exaggerated. So we can adjust that point and see the values change and visually the image changes too. So that's extreme, but let's take some out. Anyway, so um, there are things that you can do to kind of play with this. Uh, this in particular, because we're doing it in on RGB image with just the CMYK simulated on the screen by using proof setup, we're working with RGB controls and the curves panel. It's a little bit, you have to kind of think a little harder to make it work. If you have a CMYK image that you're working on, then it's a lot easier because you have CMYK in the drop down list here, and you can just modify those independently and get direct results of, of what you're expecting to be. So, again, to summarize a couple of things, we want to make sure that we're not converting anything until we're ready to output it. So, if I'm done with this image and I'm ready to uh, put it into production to print or whatever else, then this is the point where I would want to convert it. So I delete my curves. I, I don't have anything going on with it. I just threw everything away that I did. Um, but now is when I would go convert to profile. And I could choose to convert it to Grackle or, uh, you know, the custom profile for my inkjet printer or whatever I'm going to do. I would choose to convert it now. But that conversion is dependent on there being a source space and an output space or destination space. And something that you don't see on the screen here is also there's a profile connection space. So we take it from RGB into CMYK. In order for it to get from one place to the other, it goes in between to LAB. And in LAB, that's our profile connection space. All the colors, LAB think of as the true colors. That's the, that's the actual color that's in it. RGB and CMYK on the other ends of that are just the color values. They're the numbers. So the numbers in RGB need to be translated to CMYK. LAB in the middle, that's our profile connection space. That's going to be kind of the, what they actually are. I don't know if I'm making a whole lot of sense here, but <laughs> it's in the textbook. Make sure and read that stuff. But in this list, we can always make sure you just turn on the advanced open up the advanced panel here and you can have more options to see what's going on. You can choose the rendering intent. You can preview this on and off and see on your image if there's anything taking place as far as changes. You'll notice that when I turn the preview on and off, there's a difference. We're getting uh, a difference in that proof setup being applied or not being applied. So um, we're good to go. Hit OK. Convert that. Double check this. I don't have proof colors turned on anymore because I don't need them. I just converted it. And I can confirm that by seeing that this little info button is showing that it is in Grackle. And then I can save as, send it off. Now, I want to save as rather than uh, anything else because if I overwrite the original full color RGB image, then again, I've thrown away color that I didn't need to throw away. All right, 
So this like to turn into a little bit longer one than what I was hoping to do. I didn't plan to be talking to you for 40 minutes here. So hopefully you're able to skim through that and get something valuable out of it. Uh, maybe just use it as a reference. But uh, again, make sure that you do the reading. It's going to be important that you understand those concepts. They're going to be very valuable and useful. So have a good one.